Eventually, Russo meets with McMahon and explains that he's missing time with his family and that his wife now is positioning herself as a single as a single parent. Uh, so she wants to move closer to her family. And Vince is basically here asking for permission to move and is trying to sell McMahon on the fact that he'll still be on the road with him three days a week and fly up to Stanford whenever needed. Uh, McMahon says, Vince, I don't know what the problem is. You make enough money now. Why don't you just hire a nanny? That was it. All those times I was wondering if Vince truly cared about me. I was just given my answer with such a cold, callous response. I knew he didn't give a shit about Vince Russo or his family. All he cared about was his ratings, his money, and his company. I was crushed. Bruce, this nanny line has become somewhat famous. When did you first hear it, and what was your reaction? I never heard the nanny line until many, many, many years after the fact when Russo started uh quoting it publicly but it doesn't surprise me that sounds like something that vince mcmahon would say what and i and i could see him delivering it in a very cold you know very cold way um what did uh what did you know about this script idea for rope opera that never came to be what do you remember about that if anything i never heard of it but uh, i guess since he was he kept that on his own and he did all that on his own it's it's something that's very popular and and really doing well right now goodness look at you uh, well no i'm asking because he said that, that he kept it away from vince mcmahon and that he was going to do it on his own and it was this great deal but i i have no idea what happened to it so russo said if it was about money let's make it about money he told mcmahon he wanted to get out of the business when he turned 40 and that was in 15 months so he asked for one million dollars for those 15 months and then he's done russo wrote as much as he always protects his hand vince couldn't this time his facial expression dropped his cards all over the table he was shocked well that's an awful lot of money he said is it vince i answered you think i don't know what my creative contributions have meant to this company financially you think i don't know how much com how much money this company makes what steve austin makes well that's just an astronomical amount of money he said vince i know what i'm worth that's what i want I left Vince's office with telling me he'd think about it. Almost two weeks passed, and I didn't hear a word. During those two weeks, nothing had changed. It was all the same old BS. I was still working around the clock with no motivation, not even the money. Uh, when did you hear about this million-dollar pitch? I hadn't heard about this until I read the book. Yeah, I, I didn't hear about this until long after the fact, after Russo started going public with the whole nanny thing and everything else. So he accepted the job with WCW's creative director on October 2nd, 1999. Russo wrote, you know, going into WCW, a lot of people said to me, Vince, what was the difference? You were going to have to put the same amount of time in. And Russo says, the difference was there's no Vince. Again, I'm not running down the boss in any way, but unless you've been in my shoes, you couldn't fathom how taxing it was. Monday ran into Sunday, and every day was more stressful than the last. At WCW, there'd be no more trips to the salon in the city, no more phone calls on Saturday afternoon, and no more 7.30 a.m. meetings the morning following Raw. Bruce, you've worked with other promotions. This is a pretty fair assessment, is it not? True. Working with Vince is very taxing, and it takes a lot of your time, and, I mean, it will definitely wear on you. And if you can't hang, you can't hang. So, again, that's why there's a, a lot of um, turnover there. So here's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, Vince was expecting... Um, Russo to show up at the Meadowlands in New Jersey for Raw on Monday morning. And on Sunday night, Vince flew out of Atlanta and had to change planes in Philadelphia. It was around 1030, and that was his only opportunity to call. So he called Vince at home the Sunday night before Raw at 1030 at night, and Vince answered. Um, when he realized who it was, he said, hey, pal, how's it going? And... Um, he says that his heart was wedged tightly in his throat. He thought he was going to gag. His voice was cracking, and he let it spill out. Vince, I just accepted an offer from WCW. I'm going to start with them next week. Vince thought that this was a rib, and then Russo explained, no, I just got back from Atlanta. And McMahon wanted to know why. Russo said, I have nothing left to give you. You took everything I had. And then McMahon got hot and says, you know I'm going after them, and I'm going to come after you. Russo says, Vince, there's nothing to come after. I've never had a contract with you. I'm sorry, Vince. And then he says McMahon tried to make the conversation ugly. 
But Russo wouldn't participate in that, even though he was fired up. He realized it was pointless. It was over. And he didn't want the last conversation with a man that was his idol when he was younger and later a mentor to end in an argument. So he told Vince he wasn't going to let this last conversation be an ugly one. He said he just made the best decision he could for him and his family, especially with his parents living in Florida and his wife's parents living in Indiana. Atlanta was kind of right in the middle. If nothing else, she'd be able to see her parents more and the kids would be able to see their grandparents. McMahon says, I didn't know I was such a bad person, Vince. And Russo says, you're not. I never said that you were. I just have nothing left to give you. I love you. I love your family. But my tank is on empty. And then McMahon allegedly says, Vince, this is the most devastating phone call I've ever received. I just want you to know I was going to give you the money. Russo says it was never about the money. And McMahon says, I hope one day our paths will cross again. To this day, I've never forgotten those words. So that's directly from Russo's book. Did you ever talk to McMahon about how this call went? And how's this news received by the office and the boys? Did you find out that night or the next morning? I found out that night from Jim Ross, and I didn't speak to Vince McMahon about it until the next day. But Vince's recollection to me was very short that Russo called, told him that he was going to work for WCW and to move on. And that was it. Uh, there was nothing, there's nothing more in there about any of the conversation as, as he relayed. Um, it would be very uncharacteristic having been with Vince on a lot of these type of situations, whether they be in person or on the phone. Sounds a little fishy that Vince would have said, uh, you know, I would have given you the money, pal, or something like that. But, again, I wasn't there, so I can't speak to that. Russo wrote about his time in the wrestling business, but in hindsight, I'm a different animal. I'm not from that world, and I never was. What would Jim Cornette say about that? God damn right, you never will be a part of this motherfucking world either. No knives, no guns, $5,000 on the goddamn hood of my fucking truck. Um, he says that he flew back to Stanford in July 2003 to meet with Vince because, quote, there was just something calling me back to him, a sense of unfinished business. He even compares himself to Shane in the book, saying he just wants to see Vince's soft side, his human side. And he says when he finally saw Vince in 03, he was overcome with emotion and wanted a McMahon explanation as to how he really felt about him because he had been unclear all these years. And McMahon said you couldn't work that closely with someone and not care about them. And that wasn't the answer that Russo was looking for. Bruce, you worked there a long time. Why do so many grown men seek Vince's approval like this? It's a little weird. Well, no, when you spend that much time with them, it, it, it's like being a part of your family. And I think that you just are so used to being around them. You share your lives together through so many ups and downs that when it breaks up, it's like breakup of a bad marriage. Um, you just you don't want to let it go. You want to remember the good times. Well, uh, catch me up on your memory of, of Russo's return. He was back for like three weeks or something, right? Yeah, he, he came back for a very, very short stint. I wasn't actually there the day that they uh, made the announcement to the writing team. I was actually in Houston. My wife was in surgery. But I was getting calls throughout the day uh, from various writers. I was getting calls from Heyman. I was getting calls from Brian Gewertz and Michael Hayes uh, throughout the day. So it was... It was entertaining whenever I would get to a place that had reception, I, I would call in and go, what the hell's going on now? But they were told that Vince Russo uh, was coming in, and he would be named uh, the head writer over both shows, and that uh, they should get together with him and, and talk about ideas. And so they all got in a room and and started talking about ideas. I believe that Heyman and uh, Brian Gewertz were told first by Stephanie McMahon ahead of time ahead of everybody else before uh, Vince McMahon brought Russo into the room. But, uh, you know, Russo always talks about having a, a, a room full of 30 writers or something like that. I, I don't think that we had more than maybe eight people on the team, on both teams, at that time. So that's kind of kind of um, a gross exaggeration. 
But, you know, Russo always talks about, you know, how he improved ratings and did this and did that. And, and it's just when you go back and you actually look at them, you know, a lot of that just is not not true. But but Vince came into the room uh, and everybody and this came from every single person to the man, from Michael, from Paul and from Brian, that, hey, let's give him a chance and let's see what we got. If nothing else, it'll take the pressure off of us to have another intermediary between them and Stephanie. So Russo came in. They brainstormed a lot of things. Uh, I think that Russo's big idea was to strip everybody of the championships and to have tournaments. We're going to have tournaments. But uh, he wanted to – he didn't know. He asked if Triple H and uh, Chris Jericho had ever worked together when they had just headlined WrestleMania. Uh, he didn't know that a lot of people were, uh, were in the, had done what they do. He, he had done no homework whatsoever into coming back. Um, is another, you know, big idea. You know, he wanted to bring Eric Bischoff in and do, uh, an angle with Shane, which I think everybody was in favor of, except for Vince McMahon later on, I guess. But but Russo talks about how he had met with Vince days ahead and had pitched all this stuff to Vince. After Russo left that day, Vince McMahon came over to meet with the team to see what they had done. And when the team pitched all of Russo's ideas, McMahon just kind of went, what the fuck did I do? And he was taken aback. He was somewhat offended that Russo didn't even know... Uh, what had headline made event that year and, and didn't, didn't know just some of the basic storylines, uh, in the WWF at the time. But, uh, it just, I think that the guys really wanted to the man. They all wanted to work with him, but I think Russo left there feeling that, that he was buried and, uh, talked about how Stephanie talked down to him. And I think that's just Stephanie was younger at the time. And I think that's just the way that she came across with everybody. But nobody buried Russo. As a matter of fact, tried to work with him. And then for the next couple weeks, he sent emails and uh, ideas on the TVs that were being written, which Vince McMahon pretty much just dismissed and felt that this was a an experiment gone bad. And that was it. And that was it. Uh, Vince campaigns a lot in his book for credits. Um, and he even says, why aren't there any credits at the end of Raw? It's a television show, isn't it? Why isn't anyone else being given credit? I feel like that's kind of a fair thing. Back in the day, WCW pay-per-views would go off the air and there'd be credits roll. Why didn't the WWE, why doesn't the WWF give credit? What would be the harm in that? Vince McMahon just didn't believe in them. He just really, I mean, that, it's as simple as that. We used to have credits on primetime wrestling. And that was the only show. And I think that the only reason they had credits on that is because Vince didn't watch it all the way to the end. (laughs) Uh, He also makes a comparison. Have you ever heard Phil Jackson say, yeah, it was all me, all my coaching, all that Zen nonsense. Forget Kobe and Shaq. It was me. And he compares himself and Kevin Dunn to Vince's Kobe and Shaq, but feels like they're not getting the credit they deserve. Where do you land on this, Bruce? I think that internally they all got the credit that they deserve. I think he and means I think from that outside. He was looking more for it. I think he was looking more for it outside of the the wrestling bubble than outside. I think he wanted to see his name in print and in paper and on on credits. What's wrong with that? You disagree? You don't think that that's what? No, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just okay. Then go to, go somewhere where they're going to give you credit for it. But Vince didn't believe in that. Vince didn't do credits. Um, he talked about. You know, a lot happening for him during the gold dust era and the sacrifice he made. He says he basically lived the Titan Tower. He was a man possessed. Looking back now, I don't know why. I'm so caught up in the moment that I just couldn't see or hear anything else, including, again, my own family. Today I sit here embarrassed, realizing how much I sacrificed my own family for a wrestling company. During that time, they were not my priority. Work was, and I'm ashamed of it. Uh, One thing I regret deeply and that I can never make up for is that my son, Will, went from age 7 to age 12 while I worked from Vince, and I don't remember a single day from those years. Uh, Bruce, that's kind of the wrestling business, warts and all, in in a quick summary, is it not? I mean, it can be all-consuming at times. All I have to say to that is be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. 
and it was it was the wrestling business before Vince Russo was in it, and it's the business now that he's not in it anymore. Uh, Russo wrote this about why he's not in the business. It's funny, when TNA was starting up and they were talking about me coming to join them, I caught wind of a comment made by some of the people in charge. If Vince Russo was that good, why isn't he still working in the business? That attitude has always been fascinating to me. People associated with the wrestling business actually have this notion that there's nothing outside of it. If you're not in it, it's because you're not good enough. Let me ask you this. Could there even be the slightest chance that I'm no longer in the wrestling business because I choose not to be? Is that possible? Is it possible that rather than be at an arena every Monday and Tuesday night, I'd rather be at home watching Everybody Loves Raymond with my kids? Just a thought. Your response, Bruce? (laughs) <laughs> then why do you continue to petition to be in it and how you could change it if you don't want to be in it? Uh, he, uh, he finishes, we'll finish his uh, testimony here. Bizarro Land was a place I'll never forget. There were some good times. There were some bad times. But if you ask me if I'd done anything differently, if I could trade it all in, would I? The answer is no. It is a part of me that will stay with me forever. It was a five-year run that helped me put everything in its proper perspective. Career, money, family. In the end, it was all about my wife, Amy, and my three kids. All the money and success in the universe weren't worth my time away from them. Even though it hurt at times, I learned firsthand what really mattered the most. Uh, So that's kind of Vince Russo's story. He did talk about money, which we don't normally do on the show. You know, when he first comes in, he's making 60000 a year. He finishes up with the WWF at three fifty. Uh, he got some bonus checks along the way. He had that million-dollar pitch for 15 months that allegedly, once he quit, Vince accepted. It's worth noting that Vince put in his book his best year in the business was $535,000 in WCW.